Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'd like to talk about the future of agreements. And there is a couple of things that I really like about the previous presentation. The first one is to always think about uh, outcome-driven strategies that are derived from your business model, from your business capabilities, and the way you normally operate in, inside a financial services organization. And the second thing that is, I thought it was important was around the, the fact that we have to take into consideration all those cultural differentiations, elements of cultural experience. And when we talk about those two things, there is something that is normally forgotten in financial services organizations and is agreements. We spend a lot of time talking about structured data, doing a lot of data engineering, doing a lot of transformation through channels, but then when you get to the point of something that is at the core of all those experiences, you're always going to find an agreement. Uh, whether we are in retail banking, commercial banking, high-end, corporate and institutional, there's gonna be an agreement end-to-end -end that's really, that is really impacting the experience of your customers. So the first thing that I'd like to talk about is how does DocuSign think about the future? And the one thing that we do uh, fairly well is basically we always listen to all the business signals. We also, also listen to all the technology trends that are happening globally. And we also uh, take a level of a specialization and we try to understand everything that is happening in every country and every, every region. What you see on the screen is a number of examples of the socioeconomic, geopolitical, and other considerations that we look at. And to give you an example, when we look at some of the society and demographics, aging population is something that is happening throughout many countries. So the question that we ask ourselves is how do we look at this from the point of view of human-centered design? And in that sense, if you look at the aging population, there are three things that they care about. The first one is transparency. So if you're putting an agreement in front of uh, someone who is part of that demographic, obviously the first thing that they want to, to see is that they understand that agreement that is really transparent from the point of view of all the terms that are contained within that agreement. The second thing is they want to be able to ask any questions about that agreement. An example of that would be, I want to know uh, what are going to be the fees and charges, how, how long before I can get out of this agreement if I'm not happy with it, what, what's gonna be the point of friction if I want to go to another bank? Going back to the presentation that we saw first when we talk about open banking. And then the other thing that is going to be important, they want to be able to um, understand what is going to be the impact of what they are signing, and it has to be clear. And then the last part is, uh, if you look at the aspects of employee experience, banker experience, it's really important for them to be able to serve the customer through different channels. If these customers are going through self-service, if they are going through a contact center, if they are going through a face-to-face -face interaction with one of the bankers, Obviously, they want to have answers to all their questions, and they want those things to happen quickly. But then what happens in reality is if you had the opportunity of being at a contact center and seeing how they have to scramble to open a myriad of applications and they don't have a unified experience, at the same time, they don't have all the information they need on that, on that customer, and it turns into, into a real challenge. So one of the things that we are very uh, that we, we really understand is the importance of not only providing the experience to customers, but also providing the experience to uh, the people that work internally in a bank or a financial services organization. The other thing that we do is obviously we tap into the emerging trends that are happening in different types of technologies. And obviously the one that everyone has spoken of in this session is, uh, is about large language models. And we've been working with generative AI and large language models for about a year in a bit of an experiment, experimental mode. And we look at all the aspects of the impact that it has on transparency, the impact that it has on security, the impact that it has on explainability from the point of view of the AI models. And then obviously we are combining that with a lot of the other models that we have developed over the last couple of years to make sure that we offer an end-to-end -end experience. 
And then the other thing that we're doing in this space is making sure that we fine tune those models to get to the point where they have a high level of precision and a high level of accuracy. And we have petabytes of data to be able to do that. And we are making really good progress. One thing that I would like you to encourage to do if you have a chance is in Singapore in August, we are running an event called uh, DocuSign Momentum 2023. And that's an, a session where we're going to uh, announce a number of these uh, areas where we have made a lot of progress in terms of um, AI and intelligent agreements. So what does the experience for the future is going to look like from the point of view of agreements? If you think about um, a mortgage, for example, um, is very sequential. The actions that take place through touch points of that experience are happening uh, one after the other and can be very slow. When we talk about the future experience, we think um, banks that are moving into uh, a type of event-based architecture where there is events flying everywhere from front, middle to back office, and then translating into something that is going to provide a notch for the customer to be able to have a better experience, then uh, it's going to become a lot more dynamic. It's going to become a lot more on demand. At the same time, we think it's going to be very adaptable and a lot more frictionless. And we'll go into a couple of examples of how that will happen and is going to be discovered by AI. And we talk about a couple of examples, being able to get a summary of your agreement, being able to ask questions about your agreement, and get that information in front of you to uh, create transparency. Also, uh, trust and compliance is, is at the core of agreements. And that's, that's an area where we are being very careful in terms of how we manage AI that has the potential to open a Pandora's box from the point of view of security and trust. Especially when we talk about banking, there's got to be full transparency. And there is also has to be full auditability. And auditability is obviously very important because there's going to be a point in time where the auditors or the regulators are going to come in and they're going to want to know if we've done the right thing from the point of view of fairness to the customer. And then the last part is Agreements don't live in isolation. They are part of a larger ecosystem, and obviously the integration into every process, every capability, and every system that runs in the bank that has anything to do with enriching that experience is going to be important as well. Now, uh, what you see here is probably a bit overwhelming, but it's something that we call the system of agreement. And it's very similar to what you see in banks today or financial service organizations where you talk about uh, systems of records, system of record, for example. And the idea with that is an agreement is not just about a signature. There is a lot of things that happen before the signature and post the signature that can definitely add a lot of value to what banks do today. And from the CXO perspective, if you are able to improve the productivity and efficiency around all these processes, that's going to translate into a better NPS. It's going to translate into uh, becoming the main financial institution for that customer. It's going to translate into cost to income ratio, for example. And um, the other thing that is going to come out of this also is going to create a lot of improvement around your ESG goals, everything to do with um, contributing to sustainability. And I'll go from left to right. The ideal scenario is when we go through agreement generation. In the front office, you might have a number of bankers that are dealing with customers, for example, in commercial banking or in capital markets. And then they want to create some agreement at the click of a button instead of having to do everything manually. After that, there might be some elements of ID verification. Obviously, Singapore is in a good, pl in a good place from the point of view of the Singapore Pass. But especially for those banks and financial organizations that were operate across multiple geographies, this becomes a bit of a, a more complex question because you have to deal with a lot of the different aspects of ID verification. And we look at the uh, intelligence that is there, uh, and most people definitely prefer biometrics, lifeness style of detection because that removes a lot of the friction. And at the same time, uh, after that step, you might go into review negotiations. We talk to many banks in region, 
And obviously, many of the things that are happening in retail banking, for example, are pretty much following a template for a contract. But then when you think about the high end of uh, commercial banking, or if you think in capital market sense, there is a lot of agreements that need to be negotiated. Every time that we are doing uh, project finance, as an example, there is a number of parties, and there is a lot of negotiations going back and forth. Also, many of the horizontal functions that operate in your organization, whether it's procurement or legal or parts of HR, they would have negotiated agreements. And the important part of that is you want to get to signature as quickly as possible. And we'll talk about the improvements that are coming in, are coming in the future in that sense. And then once the signature is there, that's not the end of it because there is a number of actions that you might want to take. In the general sense of a mortgage, for example, after the transaction has taken place, you might want to update your product ledger. You might want to update other systems of record. You might want to update your customer master and so on. And then from there, those uh, agreements would go into a secure repository. I've been in banking for about 30, 37 years and I've seen uh, a lot of things in my time and they relate to how agreements are kept in people's desktops, in their laptops, in, uh, in servers, in SharePoint and a lot of other places. And that creates a lot of risk for the bank and it creates a lot of uh, untapped opportunity because you don't know what's contained in those agreements. You don't know what bankers have agreed to. You don't know what obligations are contained in those agreements. And then once they land into a secure repository, that's where you are able to have that visibility and transparency. And then the last part, which is probably most exciting, and then there will be a lot of work around these spaces, analytics and intelligence of those agreements which is basically be able to have a, a layer of semantic search on your agreements to be able to understand and ask any questions about those agreements. And I'm not talking about just one agreement with a customer, but we can talk about agreements that expand across a territory that you are managing from the point of view, all the different segments and all the different tiers of customers that you are managing. And the most important about that cycle and system of agreement is that there is visibility across the board. So everything that you are storing in, in that secure repository is gonna be visible at the front, in front office in your CRM systems, for example. Now, what we'll do is explore each one of those stages, and I'll give you a few hints about the, uh, the things that are coming and that are really exciting about the future of agreements. Uh, the first one would be how, how we will have the capability to to have automated generation of clauses and templates. At this point in time, if we look at the way many banks and financial services organizations operate, everything is coming out of paper, and then they are simply uh, hard-coded templates that get used time, time and time again. But what happens when different customers are going to start asking for more flexibility, especially at the high end of, of banking? Then we need to have that ability to be able to generate an agreement uh, from the point of view of the clauses at the templates, I should be able to have the ability of asking to generate a new template if we are creating a new product and service that is going to, to meet the needs of a particular segment. We were talking about the aging population. It could be that I create a product that is going to increase loyalty with those customers, and then I want to be able that, that, to have that capability. Uh, I want to have a lot of connectivity, so all those Elements of data that are part of that agreement are coming from the masters of data of those agreements. And I want to configure it so that it can be used and deployed anywhere. If we go back to the mortgage example, uh, we could be dealing with brokers, with broker aggregators, with a, a lot of intermediaries. And if they are using an iPad and they are trying to agree with one of your customers, then they should be able to do so in a way that is usable and flexible. And the last part is, uh, that if, from the point of view of agreement generation, there, there should be a lot of flexibility when it comes to data. And the idea is when you go into a channel, you should be able to have different elements of the agreement that are flexed according to what you are entering at that point in time. It could be that it detects what geography you are in. It could detect what type of information you, you have entered in a form. It could detect any other preference, and, and based on that, it's going to modify the agreement on the fly. 
This is a little bit of a concept, but it's good. I think it's good in terms of understanding. I don't want to get too theoretical here, but it's basically to understand that when we talk about dynamic assembly of agreements, it can be a bit complicated, but uh, with the use of AI and the use of integration, it can be made a lot simpler. It's basically to say when we look at an agreement and every time that we structure a solution for a customer, whether it's in retail bank or commercial bank or anything else, there's gonna be some back information. There's going to be customer information, product information, pricing information, and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, the idea is for, for this to come together and to come together in a way that can be understood by the customer and that is going to be accurate based on all that information. Some is going to be static, some is going to be variable based on that experience that is being offered to the customer at that point in time. Now we move to uh, ID verification, and that's another space that is very exciting. I know that in Singapore there is um, a, lot of, a, a lot of work that has been done through government, but at the same time, if you work in other geographies and if you have customers in other geographies, there is a lot of different things happening in this space. Uh, the first one is AI is being used from the point of view of biometrics and liveness detection. And then the good news is that from the point of view of uh, cultural differentiation, there's also been uh, a lot of advances in that sense. The other important thing here is also the concept of ID aggregation. And it's to say that banks don't work in silos. There is also the, the thinking, again, going back to human-centered design, if I'm a customer, banking is not, is not the only thing that I do. Dealing with financial services organizations is not the only thing that I do. I could be uh, buying games, I could be um, buying goods, I, would be co I could be going to an e-commerce site and so on and so forth. And then those experiences are always connected to some financial services aspect. And if I have been verified by my main financial institution, I don't want to have to be verified again to be able to perform an action. So uh, that's when ID aggregators and aggregation of ID verification is becoming really important. And the other important thing about ID verification is that it's always at the forefront of the security of the bank and financial service organizations because every time that we open an account, every time that we do a high value transaction or every time that we do um, anything that might compromise uh, mon monetary value, then obviously ID verification will come into play. Similarly, with all the parties that we deal with, uh, as we go to a AML, KYC, and ongoing due diligence, ID verification is obviously a must. And these days, many of the banks that I have seen, they are doing that manually, and that takes a lot of effort. And it really kills anything around productivity and efficiency, especially in middle and back office. Now if we move to review and negotiation, and I won't spend a lot of time on this because I know that for financial service organization is not it's not a big thing, but it, it is probably for some of the areas in the, in the back office. And, and the idea is what you want to see in the future is that you clearly see many of these things we have today, but you can, you can see, you can redline your document, especially in those areas where you are not agreeing with the other parties. It could be a, supp a supplier. It could be a, f a FinTech that you are partnering with and you are trying to agree on the, on the terms and conditions. And then you, you want to not only see the redlining, but you also want to be able to have some guidance on how to respond to that redlining. At the same time, you, I'm not sure if you guys have come near the legal department in your organization, but obviously they have the concept of playbooks. And the idea with playbooks is they offer a lot of guidance, they offer a lot of standardization around uh, the way we should agree with other areas of the, with other areas outside of the organization. And that's really important from the point of view of having those guardrails to stay legal and to stay uh, safe from the point of view of risk. And the idea is we should be able to automatically align to those uh, playbooks and at the same time offer guidance and suggestions around improvements uh, over time. And I'll explain about that adaptability in, a, in, in this slide. When we are going through a, a non-disclosure agreement with another organization, it could be that all the standard terms are okay in between both parties. 
but then there, there might be some terms in terms of governing, governing law and, and jurisdiction where there, there, seems, there seems to be a need for some negotiate, negotiated clauses. And then at that point in time, we have to ask ourselves, if this happens multiple times, it's probably a good idea to modify our, our playbook and it's a good idea to modify some of our templates because it's indicating that there is some change that has to happen and we have to remain dynamic from the point of view of the agreement. And then now when we get to the signature, obviously the most important thing is that is there now and that will be there in the future is we want to have a great experience for our customers where firstly, they need to be able to get a summarization, get a synopsis of their agreement and really understand all the terms and conditions, what they are getting into, because trust for banks and financial services organizations is critical. Uh, the other thing that we want to be able to happen is to be able to deliver this through any type of channel and any, time, any type of appliance. So in the future, obviously, people are, have wearables. They need to have a, a way to simply uh, tap on it and be able to agree. And we also, should be able to regenerate documents and agreements at any point in time as required. And we should be able to add different elements of, of value, value add before and after the agreement. If we go back to that slide where we talk about the end-to-end -end system of agreement, we need to be able to have that ability to generate, regenerate, and at the same time be able to analyze and understand what else we can do with this agreement that has just been signed. Uh, this part is really important, and obviously, over time, we have worked with a lot of uh, our partners, and outside, uh, we have Epion, as an example, but we have worked with uh, a number of other intelligent BPMSs, and obviously, within banks, every bank is, and financial service organization is at different levels of maturity in terms of how they orchestrate all the processes end-to-end, -end. and the question that we always comes up with our customers is, how do we go about uh, managing the workflow for agreements and the workflow of everything that is happening in the enterprise. And there is no clear answer, but the, the, always the, uh, the best strategy to follow is basically to think that both uh, play a key role. When we look at the IPPMSs of this world of, or anything that you have in your, in your platforms to be able to manage workflows and take the next action after we have signed an agreement. And going back to the actions, it could be Updating, updating a system uh, of record or simply, meant, uh, simply updating um, a, a product ledger. Uh, the idea is some of the BPMSs of this world will continue some of that process, but then within agreements, you have data and metadata. And if you want to be able to take action based on all the information that is contained within the agreement, if you want to be able to get approvals, if you want to be able to get reviews to get to a point of, of action, then that's when it makes sense to use the automated workflow that exists within the system of agreement. And then uh, from the point of view of secure repository, what we have done with some customers and hopefully that will continue translating into the future and will continue evolving is, I mentioned before, agreements are everywhere and they are basically posing a risk. So we want to get to a point where we can automatically migrate a lot of those agreements, make sure that we can create a standardization of, of the data model that exists within those agreements, and then be able to uh, place them in a centralized repository to analyze them later on and get a lot of value out of those agreements. Obviously, security is critical here. And every time that we look at security that is, is critical to any bank, uh, we look at it from the point of view of um, what does it imply in terms of, in terms of the data that we're exposing? Where is that data coming from? We're thinking at it from the point of view of the entire data lineage of this, the masters of the data and who are we exposing the data to? And that's one of the key risks uh, I think from the point of view of generative AI and large language models. It's great when you have an open source and you can open it to everyone. It's gonna give you a lot of value, but then when you are using these sort of models for analytics and, and, and insights, we want to make sure that if we are tapping into a structured data and unstructured data, 
such as agreements, then we are able to understand uh, uh, or to have a fine-grained model that is going to secure all that data. And from the point of view of agreements, to make sure that no agreement information is going to go to anyone that is outside of the, of the banks or the employees that need to have the information and the customer that needs to have full transparency on everything that they do from the point of view of transactional activity and from the point of view of their agreements. Uh, this is just to say there is a lot of things that come into play when we talk about the uh, management of agreements, but they have to come together and they have to work together. It's not just about the technology. It's a lot about the, the organization. How can organizations look at agreements, establish a center of excellence, have the right people in place to understand the opportunities to digitize and improve the way agreements are viewed from the point of view of the front office, middle office, and back office. And then what you see here, uh, and I won't go through it into a lot of detail because it's five aspects of agreements that we're improving in the short, in the short term, but in Momentum 2023, you're gonna see a lot more announcements on the kind of things that we can do about improvement of agreements in BFSI. Just to summarize some of the, um, the key benefits uh, that we can see for customers and uh, banks and financial services organizations. We can be summarized in three ways for customers. First, they will get full trust and transparency through all the advances that you're gonna see in the next few months. There is going to be a much quicker time to yes and time to fund for any of the things that customers are trying to do. And there is gonna be a, a much larger reduction of effort when it comes to how the customer agrees with the bank. And then from the point of view of internal, uh, obviously we expect to see improvement from the point of view of uh, the number of customers that are going to use your bank or your financial service organization as a main financial institution. Also uh, the customer base expansion because there will be an easier way of applying and using products and services. And obviously expansion of market share one of the most important ones that we always find every time that we do value realization or every time that we look at a business case for a, a banking customer or a financial services customer is cost to income ratio. Because we definitely bring a lot of improvements to all the things that are done about generating and signing and also analyzing agreements. We go into areas such as um, collateralization and securitization and so on post the agreement, which is also important. And then we are able to, to help reduce the risk score. And we are able to bring a lot of benefit around all the ESG goals from the point of view of saving papers, saving all those processes around faxing, copying, sending documents, sometimes unsecurely. And we get full visibility of all those things that you see on the right-hand side of, around an agreement. So it's really important about this risk in the bank from the point of view of understanding the obligations and at the same time, having that intelligence to be able to create a more proactive experience for customers. These are only a few examples of some of the organizations that are working with us in terms of banking and financial services, but there is obviously quite a few more. But the point here is that they are doing transformations with us around front office, middle office, and back office. And what you see on the right is some of the benefits that they've been able to achieve over time. So I want to thank you for your time and I hope this gave you a li little bit of insight into how we think about agreements and all the exciting uh, changes that are happening in the next few months.